Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and greetings to you from your brothers and sisters in Christ living in Spain. Again from our text. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. When Mary arrives at the tomb, it is still dark, and so is her faith. She seems to be unable to grasp that Jesus the Christ has been raised from the dead despite the fact that Jesus Christ himself predicted that this very event would happen just like this. She is not believing that Jesus is alive again. Jesus Christ had just been beaten, tortured, crucified, and buried. He told Mary Magdalene and his disciples that he is the Son of God and the Savior of all mankind, but now he had been brutally killed. Hope was lost that he would be the one, the Messiah. How could it be that Jesus is the Messiah if he is dead and buried? We often say to ourselves when we read about those who have come before us in the faith that if it were me, I would have believed what Jesus said, and I would have known that he must be raised from the dead. But is that really true? Are we not the same way as they were? We are told by eyewitnesses through the Holy Scriptures that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but if you are honest with yourself, that doesn't make a lot of sense and you have your doubts. We are told by Christ himself that his very body and blood are what we eat and drink in the Holy Eucharist. But you struggle to see how such a thing can be true. This is literally the oldest trick in Satan's book. It is the same argument that he used in the Garden of Eden when he looked at Eve and said, did God really say that you shall not eat of the tree? The answer is yes, he really did say that and it is the truth. The same is true about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. We are asked or even wonder to ourselves, did Christ really say that this is his body this is his blood, that his body and blood are present with the bread and wine. How can that be? But the answer is a clear and resounding yes. He really did say that we eat and drink his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist, and it is so. And the same is true in the case of the resurrection. The temptation was for St. Mary Magdalene to doubt the words of Christ, to doubt the word of God. The same thing is happening with her that happened to Eve and still happens with us. Mary Magdalene questions, did Christ really say that he would be raised from the dead? Come on, Mary, that doesn't make any sense. People don't come back from the dead. Jesus is dead and his body has been stolen. And we see Mary struggle here, but that does not change the fact that Jesus really did say that he would be raised on the third day, and it is so. But Mary was in a panic because she believed that someone had stolen the body of Jesus. It was hard enough for her to handle the fact that he was dead, but now his body was nowhere to be found and it would be impossible for him to have a proper burial, a very important thing in the culture and the day. 
And so she runs to tell Peter and John, but as St. John Chrysostom wrote regarding this account, she did not yet know anything clearly concerning the resurrection. Instead, she thought that the body had been removed, which is what she simply tells the disciples. Yet the evangelist has not deprived this woman of such praise, nor did he think it shameful that they should have learned these things from her. This shows how his love for truth is on display everywhere. You see, in the culture, a woman could not be a witness in the court of law. And yet, Mary Magdalene was chosen by God to be a witness. And this is good evidence for us to believe. If the holy evangelist St. John was making this whole thing up, he would not have chosen a woman as his star witness in his story. He would have picked a man who was in good standing in the community. In his grace and his mercy, our Lord has given us evidence to believe that this is the truth of the events of the resurrection of our Lord. He does not call us to believe a wild tale, but he calls us to believe the truth of the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ just as his divine plan had ordained it to play out all the way back in Genesis 3.15, where he first promised the coming of a savior, the coming of Jesus the Christ. But for now, Mary Magdalene was standing outside of the tomb and she was crying. Her heart was broken in sorrow for her Lord. And in the lowest point of her whole life, the Lord blesses her with a unique grace that he only gives to one person. She is given the gift of becoming the first eyewitness of the risen Lord. As she stooped to look into the tomb, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the feet. Imagine what she must have been thinking. She obviously does not recognize that they are angels, but does not show any fear of them either. They look at her and they say, Woman, why are you weeping? The angels know the situation. They know that Jesus is raised just as he said he would be, and they are asking why Mary Magdalene is turning this occasion for rejoicing into an occasion for tears. And she answers them by saying, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So she has now spoken with angels, but does not yet understand that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And then she turns around. But why does she turn around? Again, St. John Chrysostom suggests that perhaps it was because the Christ suddenly appeared behind her and struck the angels with awe. And when the angels saw Jesus, they showed immediately by their attitude, their gaze, and their movements that they saw the Lord in their presence. Perhaps this is what drew Mary's attention and caused her to turn around. This is how he appeared to the angels, but this is not how he appeared to Mary in order to not terrify her at the first sight of him. Instead, he appears to her in a more humble and ordinary form as is clear from her reaction, supposing that he is the gardener. He therefore turns to her and he says, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Look at the gentleness of our Lord in his dealings with Mary Magdalene. He knows why she is weeping, and he knows who she is looking for. But our Lord is delicate with this broken woman, and he speaks softly, and lovingly to her. But even then, Mary still does not recognize him. She assumes that he must be the gardener, and she says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where he, you have laid him, and I will take him away. It shows great love on the part of Christ that he would lead one so, of so lowly a mind to higher matters, not all at once, but so patiently and gently. And then Jesus simply says one word to her, Mary. What an incredible mercy and patience the Lord has with Mary and with all of us. And now she gets it. 
she can only utter one word, Raboni, which is Aramaic for teacher. We can imagine that she must have ran to him and threw her arms around him, but Jesus says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. What an incredible blessing that the risen Lord has bestowed upon St. Mary Magdalene. She has not only been graced with being the first eyewitness of the resurrection, but now she is graced with being the one who gets to tell the disciples this incredible good news. She got to be a witness of the most important message in all of human history. And here we are this morning, witnesses of the same crucifixion and resurrection through the grace of our baptism. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified for our iniquities, has been raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father. He comes to us through the proclamation of his pure gospel, that he has died for you, that you are forgiven indeed, that as far as the east is from the west, all of your sins are forgiven. And what's more, he comes to you continuing to be humble and merciful, humbly coming to you in bread and wine for the forgiveness of all of your sins. These are not unbelievable promises. Rather, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, you have come to know and believe your Lord has died for you. Your sins are forgiven. And this is most certainly true.